announcements for today. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. Your next homework assignment is due on Sunday. Um, so I previously gave you the suggestion to get started early on that one because of the length of the assignment. Feel free to stop by if you have any questions or you can send me emails and I'll do my best to reply. Today we're going to be talking about manometers a little bit more. We initially started talking about them last time when we were meeting on Sunday. And we're going to also discuss how atmospheric pressure changes with elevation. Before we do that, though, I wanted to give you hints on two homework problems from the set that you're assigned. The first problem that I think is a little bit complex for you is this one. And so this is a special, I don't know, assembly that's been designed. And it's got uh, three different fluids in it. It's got water, air, and then some other fluid with a specific gravity of 3.0. So what they're asking in this problem is they're asking, um, what it, where is the pressure going to be the highest inside of this whole system? And then they also want to know what is the pressure pushing up on this CD? So you can look at the cross-sectional view that that's like a uh, one meter by one meter plate. And they want to know for the pressure that's pushing up, what's the equivalent force on that area? So this is just a matter of applying the hydrostatic equation. Remember, when you go down, the pressure accumulates, and then you go over. Now, <clears throat> here in the air, what you can assume is that you know, pressure does vary through air, but it's not going to vary noticeably in just two meters. To get a pressure change through air, you have to go a high distance. So although the pressure is changing rapidly down through water because it has a high unit weight, you can go up through the air, and the pressure is basically the same. So the hint is the pressure here and the pressure here are the same because they're touching the same amount of air. All right? And then as you go down, the pressure accumulates again and over the pressure is the same. And so then everywhere inside of this chamber that's air, the pressure is the same again. So just find, as you go through your calculations, what's the pressure here, what's the pressure there, there, you know, in the different locations, where is the pressure the highest? And then you can find the force acting on this square piece by the formula pressure times area. So those are the hints for that problem. Now for the next one, this is a special device that's bolted onto a table. And there's water inside it. And they tell you the dimension L is 80 centimeters. And so you can use the hydrostatic equation to find the pressure at the bottom of this special looking tank. So it doesn't matter the width, right? No, the width doesn't matter. Even though this is very narrow, this top section, the pressure is still increasing at the same rate according to delta P is delta H times the unit weight of the liquid. So you find the depth, the pressure at that depth, and then this is a matter of finding a force balance. They're asking what force is required from the bolts to hold the dome in place. So these bolts are pushing down on the dome. What do you think would happen if these bolts weren't here? Just try and visualize in your mind. If you had a metal, uh, a metal dome and water in it, but you weren't clamping down on it. Yeah, the water's going to leak out the edge. So that's why they're clamping. They're holding the dome in place with those bolts. And we want to know, what is the minimum force required to hold it in place so that the water doesn't leak out? So it's a force balance in the vertical direction. So think of the system is the dome and the water. Let's do a force balance considering that. So the table is pushing up on the water with the same force that the water is pushing down on the table. So this, the pressure at the bottom, and the area of the bottom, that's sort of like an external force pushing up on the system, where the system is water and the metal container. So that's an upward force. And then all of the other forces act down. There's the force of the bolts pushing down on this container so that the water doesn't leak out. Then there's the weight of the water and the weight of the dome. So those three forces act down. And then the pressure up is just an equal and opposite reaction to the water pressure that's pushing down on the table. And so we're considering 
the external forces on the system. And that's why the, the table pushing up we consider as a, a force. So those are the hints that I want to give you for those two homework problems. Be sure to indicate the direction of the force in this question. It's asking the, uh, the bolts what force and what direction of the force is required. So get both of those components. All right. Last time we were talking about manometers. And the first manometer type that I showed you was what if we just had a pipe and put a hole in the pipe. And if that's all we did, and this is water, then water is going through the pipe like this, and it starts spraying everywhere. But instead of just a hole only, we put this tube here. And what affects how high the water rises in there? What is that a measurement of? Pressure. If you have a high pressure in the pipe, the water rises high. If you have a low pressure in the pipe, then the water doesn't come up very much. So that was the first type of piezometer we looked at. This YouTube manometer, this is YouTube, just like the, before there was YouTube, the website, there were these YouTubes for measuring pressure. It's just with the letter U, though, because it's shaped like a U. And uh, the reason why this is an advantage, I told you one of the problems with this type of piezometer is that the water has to rise really, really high to measure the pressure. Like typical height would be 50 meters for typical pressure in a water network. Well, what if we had a different fluid that was more dense? You know, this water is flowing through the pipe, so water has to be in the piezometer. But this U-tube manometer has the advantage of we can put a different fluid inside the U section than is flowing through the pipe. And if we use mercury, which is very, very dense and has a high unit weight, then that means the deflection delta H, which we use to measure the pressure, is going to be much smaller than the deflection would have to be if the fluid was water. Mercury is about 13.6 times more dense than water is. So delta H will be 13.6 times less big than it would be if we were using water as our uh, liquid. So let's just use some specific numbers to take a look at how the, uh, how the YouTube manometer works. And uh, we've got four examples today. You're only going to be able to do the calculations on one of them because we're so pressed for time in view of the quiz. So I've got the numbers here. I'll pull the solution up on the screen. And hopefully seeing those numbers will be uh, almost as good as if you'd done the calculations yourself. All right. Surrounding this is air. And if we're working in gauge pressure, what do we say uh, air pressure is in gauge? Zero. Right. So for gauge, we say, let the atmosphere be zero. So what that means is we're going to say that the pressure of the manometer fluid at one is zero, okay? because it's touching the air. So here we've got pressure is zero. And then what happens to the pressure as we go down through a fluid? Increases. So we'll find the pressure at two. And when I pull up the numbers in a minute, that will be the formula we use for it is delta P equals delta H, which in this case is 0.45 meters, times the unit weight of mercury. How does the pressure at 2 and the pressure at 3 compare? Why, yeah, they're equal. Why is it that they're equal? Same height. Anytime you have the same fluid and the same height, the pressure is equal. Now let me give you a caution. The pressure is not equal here at 1, and then straight across from one. Those pressures are different. It's because we've got different fluids in between one and straight across from one. But from two to three, you can go down and then back up through the same fluid, so the pressure at those two spots is the same. Uh, this is water, and this is mercury. Yeah. So the deeper, like, those shades of blue are a little ambiguous, but Manometer liquid is mercury, and then it's water flowing through the pipe. Okay, so pressure 2 equals pressure 3. Then how are we going to find the uh, pressure at 4? Any guess? What approach have we been using so far? Just apply the hydrostatic equation. So will the pressure at 4 be more or less than the pressure at 3? It's going to be less because we're going up. And so we'd say pressure at 3 minus delta H, I'm sorry, minus delta P is the pressure at 4. So let's pull up those numbers and have a look. All right, so here I've done the drawing. 
I've got my constants, the unit weight of water, the unit weight of mercury, and uh, starting with the pressure at 1 is 0, then I find the pressure at 2 is delta H times the unit weight, so 60 kPa. Pressure at 2 and pressure at 3 is the same, and then pressure 4 is whatever it was at 3, and then since I'm going up, it's minus delta P. And so the minus delta P is going to be L, which was 1.83 times the unit weight of water. So going through those steps, I can find that the pressure of 4 is 42.1 kPa. That's how a manometer works. Now what I'd like to do is give you a little bit more complicated one to actually do the calculations on. Yeah, all of a sudden, wow, what is going on with this thing? We've got three fluids on this illustration. Where do we start in a problem like this? We want to find what is the pressure at A. So anytime you're working on a problem, you start with what you know, and you work towards what you don't know. Okay, you know the gauge pressure is zero where? Right here, because that's open to the air. So this interface is touching the air, so this is where we begin. We're going to work our way towards the unknown and calculate the pressure at A. So I'm going to bring the lights up, give you some time. It's this same formula everywhere where the, uh, the unit weight of mercury that you're going to use, unit weight of mercury is 13.6 times 9810 newtons per meter cubed. And we say that that oil there, the unit weight of the oil is 0 0.8 times the unit weight of water, 9810 newtons per meter cubed. Okay, so C, if you can, when you go down, the pressure increases. When you go up, the pressure decreases. And work from the known towards the unknown. Yeah, switch to meters, yep. So let's just see if you're headed in the right track here. All right. Part of the problem here is that they've made the dimensions a little tricky, right? So we go down 0.9 meters through the water. Then we're going down 0.6 meters through the mercury. Then we're going up what distance through the oil? 1.8 meters, because here's 1.5 and then this extra 0.3 goes over. So we're going up 1.8 through the oil and then down 1.5 through the water. So those are the distances. Okay, so back to the sketch. All right, so we know the unit weight of oil, <coughs> the unit weight of mercury, and then we just start adding and subtracting like we're accountants really. Uh, pressure at 1 is 0. Pressure at 2 is pressure at 1 plus the change. So the change is 88.29, I'm sorry, 88.29 pascals. Then the pressure at 3 is the pressure at 2 plus the change. Why do you add here? Because we're going down. Anytime we go down through the fluid, the pressure, the pressure is accumulating. All right, so then from 3 until 4, we're going up through oil, so it's going to be minus, uh-oh, okay, so pressure at 4 is the pressure at the minus the change, and then finally the pressure at uh, A is the pressure at 4 plus the change, because now we're going down through the, uh, the water. I really, all right, there it is, 89.5 kPa. So if I zoom out, just to get the full view all at once of what we saw and did here. So we go down through the first liquid, down through the second, so it was water, then mercury, up through the oil, down through the water, and we arrive at the finish there. All right. Yes, question? This one? That between three and four. So if you look, here is 3 and here is 4. We subtract because the pressure at 4 will be lower than the pressure at 3 because we're going up through a fluid. Remember, we're going up from here to here, and then the pressure here and there is the same on either side of that since there's the same liquid all the way through it. 
Yeah. The top? Yeah, the curve, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no. The pressure here and the pressure here is the same regardless of whether this tube is wide or if it's small. We wouldn't draw point four anywhere other than at an interface. See, all of these locations have been selected because that's where two fluids are touching, two different fluids. So that's what's important to us. We apply the hydrostatic equation uh, from boundary to boundary. Good question. Yeah. How do you know where to put the locations? And you pick these locations based on where different fluids are touching. And hopefully your dimensions are given so that that's you know, what you can measure. All right, so you've got a homework problem like this, and it would be most efficient if you worked that homework problem today, after you've just been thinking of it. It would be less efficient if you worked on it uh, Saturday night, okay? Or, or Sunday morning, yeah. That would be even less efficient, right? 3 a.m. on Sunday? All right, so another kind of manometer, instead of having the end open to the atmosphere, what if we connected the end of a U-tube manometer back into the pipe? So what that would be measuring is it would be measuring instead of the pressure relative to the air, this kind of a manometer where it's connecting the end back up into the pipe is measuring the difference in pressure between two locations. So you have it connected to the pipe here, connected to the pipe there. If the pipe is horizontal, then what this is measuring is the difference in pressure between one and two. So you can see the formula is saying for a horizontal pipe, Delta P is the difference in the unit weights, so the unit weight of the manometer minus the unit weight of the uh, manometer fluid minus the unit weight of whatever's flowing through the pipe times delta H. Now a warning, this equation is only valid if the pipe is horizontal. We have a more useful generalized equation here. P sub Z means the change in piezometric pressure. And just to remind you from something we've seen previously, what is piezometric pressure? Piezometric pressure includes both the elevation and the pressure. And so P sub Z is P plus gamma Z. So it means we're going to pick some datum, some horizontal datum, and measure not only the pressures, but also the elevation uh, relative to that datum. So here, in the horizontal pipe, Z1 and Z2 are equal, which is why this equation comes out of the more generalized equation, as if, if the Zs are the same, then it's just change in pressure that you're measuring. But this is the equation we could use if we have an inclined pipe. So here where we have an inclined pipe, we want to measure uh, the pressure at 2, because we know here at 1, the pressure is 450 kPa. And um, so the advantage of a differential manometer like this is it tells you how much the pressure is changing, not only just because of an elevation change, but it tells you how much the pressure is changing due to pipe friction. We haven't talked about pipe friction yet, but what happens is when water is flowing through a pipe, the water is touching the edge of the pipe and uh, the edge of that pipe is slowing down the water. It's providing resistance as the water flows next to it. And so you lose pressure because of that resistance. And this differential manometer is a way for us to measure how much of the pressure change between one and two is due to the elevation, because the pressure will be different just because of hydrostatics. When you go up through a fluid, the pressure is decreasing, right? So part of the reason why the pressure at 2 is less than the pressure at 1 is because of the elevation change. But then also, since we have water flowing through a pipe, some of the pressure change is also due to pipe friction. So what this piezometric pressure change, PZ1 minus PZ2, that is a way for us to know how much of the pressure change is because of pipe friction. We can separate the two. 
In this picture, we have two different types of fluid, though. We've got, for one thing, water flowing through the pipe and mercury in the um, manometer. But then there's another thing, a really important thing we have to keep in mind. Water is flowing through the pipe. That's not static. Remember, static means not moving. And so for the hydrostatic equation, what we're going to do is apply the hydrostatic equation through this tube, because inside the tube, the water isn't flowing. That's a really important thing, so I'm going to mention it again. Inside this differential manometer, conditions are static. So we can apply the hydrostatic equation in this little small tube, but we can't go straight from 1 to 2 using the hydrostatic equation because it's not static conditions. If we want to know what is the pressure at 2, we have to take a detour in the calculations through the manometer in order to find the pressure at 2. So in this illustration, what it's asking is, number one, what is the pressure at 2? And then what is the change in piezometric pressure between the two locations? And so let me show you what those calculations look like. In the differential manometer. All right, now, this is just saying start where you know something and work towards the unknown. That's what you just barely did in that complex manometer over here. You started where you knew the pressure. Here it was known to be zero. And you worked through the tube to the location you're interested in. Same thing here. We're starting where we know the pressure. We know the pressure at one. And we're going to work our way using the hydrostatic equation through this tube until we pop out at two. So that's what this is saying. This is saying the pressure at one plus, because we're going down through the fluid, the distance delta y times the unit weight of water. And then you're going plus delta h, which takes you from here down to the interface, times the unit weight of water. And then we're going to go up 0.5 centimeters through the mercury, and then up delta y through the water, and up 1 meter through water and then that gives us equal to the pressure at 2. So the pressure is known, a bunch of changes, just like we're accounting for the changes in pressure, and then we know the pressure at 2. So if you substitute in the numbers, we know the pressure at 1 is 450,000 uh, pascals, and then it's increasing a little bit through the water, and I canceled out a term, by the way. Here we had plus uh, delta y times unit weight of water, and here was minus delta y times unit weight of water. So I just canceled those two terms out. And that's why we have a secondary expression underneath it. So the starting point, plus some pressure, minus some pressure, minus some pressure, and then that gets us to location two. So it's just anytime you're going up, the pressure is decreasing. Anytime you're going down, the pressure is uh, increasing. And we found the pressure at two here is 434 pascals. What are, the two, what are the two reasons why the pressure at 2 is lower than the pressure at 1? Because the pressure at 1 was 450. The pressure at 2 is lower than that. What are the two reasons it's lower? Okay, partly it's the height, right? What? It's partly because of pipe friction, right? So this pressure at 2, we don't yet know exactly how much of it is due to the height and how much of it is due to the friction. What the change in piezometric pressure tells us is how much of that is due to the pipe friction. So here we just apply the formula. The change in piezometric pressure is delta H times the difference in the unit weights. Mercury was our manometer fluid. Water is what's going through the pipe. So we do the difference in those unit weights multiplied by the deflection inside the differential manometer. And that tells us the delta P sub Z. So 61.59 pascals is due to pipe friction, and the rest of the difference is because of the elevation change between location one and location two. All right. We've got three minutes remaining. So I'm going to tell you about the concepts, and then I'm going to post the uh, calculation example online so that you can uh, see it and look at it more, with more length. Here's what you need to know about pressure variation. When you go up through the atmosphere, the air gets colder. 
You probably already knew that. If you've flown on a plane before, sometimes they tell you what's the temperature outside. It's like negative 30, negative 40 degrees. It's really, really cold up in the upper atmosphere. There is a general trend for how much it cools. On average, it cools negative 5.87 degrees per kilometer of elevation. So that's called the temperature lapse rate. And you can find the temperature at any elevation you're interested in by putting it into this equation. It's the temperature where you know, like maybe at ground level, times this lapse rate multiplied by the change in elevation. It's a linear expression, this lapse rate. And so you can find out, on average, what the temperature should be at any elevation. Well, once you know the uh, change in temperature, this expression on the right side is the change in temperature. You can substitute it into this expression because it's that change in temperature up here in the numerator. This expression tells you how the pressure changes as a function of elevation. Because if the air temperature is changing, then the pressure is going to change as well. And um, so this expression here where G is 9.81 and alpha is the lapse rate and then R is the ideal gas constant, then you can find out the pressure at some elevation, like at the top of Mount Everest or at the top of Burj Khalifa, how the pressure would change. P naught would be the pressure someplace you know it. It's at, like, say, at ground level. So it's not necessarily always just the absolute atmospheric pressure, but it's someplace where you know it. So it would be the pressure at the elevation of Z naught. So here in this example, what I'm going to show you, the, the PDF I'm going to post in iLearn, uh, is showing what if we know the pressure of the air and the temperature at the base of Burj Khalifa? We know the elevation difference. So let's find out what is the temperature up there, and let's find out what is the pressure up at the top. Here is the R value for air, and here is our lapse rate, which tells you on average it's changing 5.87 Kelvin per kilometer in of elevation. And so what you'll be able to look at for a longer amount of time, because it's posted online, is how we go through the calculations and finding the temperature at the top of Burj Khalifa and the pressure at the top of Burj Khalifa. So have a glance at that. And once you see the example, then I think the uh, related homework problem you have in the set should be very simple. All right, so have a great day, and I will see you next Sunday.